definitions, a process for employee privacy, a way for the CHRO and the leadership team to make decisions and to approve change requests, your HRIS system and your analytics will not be successful. So data governance is super important. Then we're going to have some fun. So you're about to see how hard this task actually is. We're going to do a facilitated exercise, you and me, where we're going to try to create just one, just one key performance indicator and you're going to find, like, man, this is hard. <laughs> Holy cow. But as you go through this, you'll see here's some of the questions you need to ask as HR leaders. Here's how you need to connect with your chief financial officer and your CIO. And here's what you need to do to bring the insights to life to help drive decision making. Next slide, please. All right, so some key shifts for HR leaders. Future of work equals... People plus machines, right? If you learn anything in this presentation, it's people plus machines. Now, the more you start thinking about that is how can machines and human beings interface together, augment each other, work well together, the more you're going to be able to drive a lot of these future-oriented strategies in your business. The second one is a skills-based collaborative commons, and I think this probably impacts uh, Nepal a great deal is that job titles and job roles are less important today compared to skills. If someone has a very high demand skill, whether it be data science or financial analysis, the ability to retain that individual is quite challenging. So this skills-based collaborative commons, you're actually seeing the concept of Uber move into the workplace where employees are able to apply their skills in multiple environments, multiple organizations, and they're able to go from company to company to company. And as leaders, to retain people with high skills, pretty much of a challenge. The third one is the CHRO is going to have to know some math. He's going to have to be a bit of an engineer in the future. Now, I know a lot of folks get into HR because they don't like engineering. They, they want to be more about the people-oriented approach, customer-facing, employee experience. But there's just no way to get around it, right? Since part of the formula is people plus machines, you will have to learn some engineering, some IT, some technical leadership skills in order to manage HR in the future. Now, just by a show of hands, get everybody relaxed so that we can start participating. When you hire and you do your ratings or any other HR process, how much of this is driven by artificial intelligence? So just by show of hands, is half of your processes influenced by AI? Yes or no? Anyone with greater than half? Wow. So, what you'll find is in Singapore, United States, Europe, everyone would raise their hands. Because in the future, pretty much every process dealing with human resources is going to have some kind of artificial intelligence influencing the decision. So, in it, for example, in the US, when you apply for a job, a machine actually analyzes your resume and tells the recruiter whether you're a good match for the job. So technically, to get a job in the United States, you have to impress a machine before you impress the hiring manager. And that is kind of the future. And then the last one is this automated competency frameworks. Now, this is where it can really add value for your organization. Imagine if you hire someone for a financial analyst role. You work at a bank, you hire them for a financial analyst role, and the minute you assign them to a job title in the system, it gives you an entire development plan in an automated way. It says what job assignments they need, what courses they should take, what certifications are required, and it assigns them a mentor, and also says what they need to do every year of their career journey in order to develop into higher level roles. That's what's cool about analytics, is it helps scale and improve the efficiency of how you do things. Okay, next slide, please. 
All right, so some top five HR analytics best practices. The first one, and I think this one is critical, is that going from zero to one in anything is the hardest to do, right? If you've ever started an exercise routine, just getting going is the hardest to do, right? Uh, when you're doing something at work and you're trying to learn a new skill, the first few weeks, the first few months, it's challenging. It's the same with data analytics. Going from zero to one is the most challenging thing. That is the phase where the CHRO and the director of HR has to lend the sponsorship. So that's best practice number one. Number two, you got to have governance in every single process. And you'll see it as we go through this facilitated exercise. There should be rules, committees. It sounds scary. It's not like the union. So I'm not saying like uh, when the CEO is here that we're creating another union, right? But you have to govern your data because quality data leads to quality decision making. But the only way you have quality data is through good governance. The next one is the technology roadmap should actually align with how you make decisions. Now, just out of, you know, show of hands again, because we're going to start working on this as an audience. How many of you have technologies that don't do what you thought they were going to do when you bought them? <laughs> Steve? Anybody? So you have all your systems. Wow, we, we got to come to Nepal more, man. They, they got everything working with their HRS system. It's great. But you need to make sure that your technology roadmap, your uh, core HR system, your learning system, your talent acquisition processes, all of those things should be driving towards how you make decisions. And then the last two really are about the same thing, is that when you work on analytics, you want to be very narrow, very defined on the use cases or the projects that you sponsor. You don't want to create a big project. You want it to be very narrow. And then second to that, you want to over-communicate results. So a good technique you can use is called the sandwich method. So think of it as slice of bread is something positive. The meat is the critique or something that needs to be worked on. And then the other slice of bread is something positive. So when you're dealing with analytics, you over-communicate the results. You have two positives for one negative, and that helps the executive stay involved. The last one is you just want to build that digital skill set, that digital fluency in all levels of the organization. So again, it's different in Nepal, but in some organizations I've worked in, in different countries, on day one, if an HR business partner is hired, they start taking data science classes. They start learning about HR technology on the first day as part of their development. Next slide, please. All right. So this is where the process comes in, and we're going to use this as we do our facilitated exercise. So this is the people analytics value chain. Now, one of the CEOs, he had an interesting quote. He said that culture eats strategy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, right? I would agree with that, but I would say that strategy is the appetizer. <laughs> Data is the main meal, right? And this is really where the rubber meets the road. So when you think about it, on the left-hand side, is, it's a sequence, is where you start. And as you progress to the right, you get to the end of the value chain. And there's a loop process. Now, I'm sure all of you, as you work on HR, you're used to these things. You're used to workforce planning, culture, learning and development. But how many of you, just by show of hands, actually do it in order, in this order? Anybody? You do it in order. All right. That's awesome. All right. That's fantastic. Now, why is it that we actually want to do this analytics value chain in order? Why do you think, and this is where I'll have uh, some audience contribution. We'll get started. Why would you start with the workforce plan? then go into organizational culture, then look at how you hire, then look at how you train and develop, 
before you actually look at how you do ratings, how you do succession planning, and so forth. Why do you think talent management is last? Any brave uh, participant want to give an answer? We have Jeopardy in the U.S. Anyone want to talk about the, uh, the Jeopardy countdown? Any ideas? Yes, sir. Yeah, this gentleman right here. Actually, these all are the process. Talent management is the performance part of the performance appraisal. So after working all and from strategic workforce planning, organization culture, talent acquisition, learning and development, then we'll utilize the persons and we'll uh, management the talent, you know. So that's what I'm from G4S Nepal. So we are doing in you know, a international, yes. you know, uh, onboarding, offboarding, and exit interview like that. Online process we do have. So uh, through that we are doing, but we are just initial phase. So so we are implementing that all. Oh, that's that's very cool. Exactly. So the idea is, Thank uh, you. like, great comment. The idea is is that with each step, you're actually making the next step easier. You're actually building on the prior process, and where most of the decisions come in is right here. So we had the CEOs join us. Most of the CEO decisions is in talent management. Now, in order for a CEO to make a good decision, it's up to HR to do all these steps beforehand, so that when you get to talent management, and you're discussing high potentials, succession plans, promotions, performance ratings, you have a very robust structure in place. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is about as technical of a slide as you'll see this entire presentation. So, but I just wanted to highlight the journey that you go on. If you're going to create an HR analytics function uh, within your organization, it's going to usually go through three separate stages uh, as it moves from being a beginner novice organization to an advanced, predictive, analytics-driven HR function. So the first step is describe. The second step is infer. And the third step is predict. So you go through these three stages. You describe, you infer, and you predict. So in the first stage, describe, you're asking, what is happening? What's happening in the business? And in this stage, usually executives want a KPI dashboard, right? They want some metrics. They want to understand what attrition is doing. What are the training courses? What are the certifications and so forth? What is happening? Now, the skills to actually generate this data are not too bad. You can use Excel. You can use SQL Server. But most HR professionals who are non-technical can handle the described phase with minimal help from IT. However, as you move into the infer stage, now you're asking, why is it happening? And the point of data analytics is actually to reduce the amount of subjectivity and to use objective, data-driven insights to help executives make decisions. So when you're doing the infer stage, you get some scary words coming, but you look at regression. Concepts like ANOVA, which is statistical concept. PCA, which is principal component analysis. These are just techniques. These are data science techniques. It's not that you need to know what they are, but these are techniques that are done to understand why something is happening. So you might have a CEO look at the attrition report, the rolling 12-month attrition, and go, why are, why are people leaving? What are the reasons that somebody resigns? Well, in data science, you can actually use these statistical methods to answer that question and to say, these are the reasons, from a statistical standpoint, that people are resigning. Now, how cool is that if you brought that to your CEO and you said that we think X, Y, and Z, if you were to fix these, would lower attrition? 
Pretty valuable, right? That's the point of HR analytics. Now, the predict stage is where things get a little crazy, right? It gets a little bit like, wow, this is Terminator, this is the future, this is um, robots running everything. And it is very cool, but you're getting into neural networks. These concepts of Markov chains and reinforcement learning, what that is is actually you can create a digital machine brain that processes the same way a human brain does. Maybe not at the same complexity, but neural network, all it is, is it's modeled after the way human brains function. It's a digital human brain. And you can use that digital human brain to look at billions and billions of data and give you insights into what's going to happen in the future. But it takes an advanced team and it takes an executive um, with a strong character and ethical compass to manage that kind of function. So describe, infer, predict are the three stages. Next slide, please. All right. Does this look like a house? Yeah. So this is this HR data governance piece. Now, the way I want you to look at this, now, this may seem like, gosh, he's showing me all these slides. This is super boring. Why did they schedule this at the end of the day? We need more coffee in here. But as you go through these slides, when we get to the facilitated exercise, you're going to remember this stuff, and you're going to go, OK, this is how I solve the problem. So at the top is your corporate strategy. So remember when the CEOs were saying there needs to be a connection between corporate strategy and HR strategy? Well, this framework helps you solve that. So corporate strategy is on the top. The two gray boxes below it deal with the workforce, the human plus machine workforce, as well as your processes, so how you actually get things done. If you're a manufacturer, if you're a service provider, whatever your processes are. Then underneath it is your governance model. So there are three governance layers that you can use to improve the quality of your data. So let's just get a sense. So who here can just shout out one of the governance layers, and it's just looking at these blue boxes, that you can use to improve the quality of your data? Anybody? What's one of them? What's that? KPI dashboard, man, you rock. That's awesome. Can you give him a round of applause? All right. And see, it's the end of the day, so I'm trying to like get us going, you know, so let's, let's have more folks talk. What are the other two? Just scream them out. There, I'll, I'll help. What's this? Content Hub, yeah. All right, what's the last one? Yeah, cool. This is not a union, by the way. It's not a union. All right, so when you're trying to drive quality data, you can do three things right away. You can set up a CHRO talent council, which should consist of the CFO, the chief information officer, as well as several kind of subject matter experts, but it's very important that the chair, the chair of this governance process is the CHRO, okay? It can't be any other executive. This council has to be run by the CHRO because it's the council that'll approve the KPIs. The content hub is you want to have a one-stop shop for where you put everything. So if you have a learning program, if you have a talent acquisition program, if you have any kind of KPIs, you want to put them in this one-stop shop content hub. And then the third is this KPI dashboard, which is the entry level into HR analytics. OK, next slide, please. All right. Now, how does this connect with HR and IT? Now, I, I want you to remember the, the session with the CEOs and, and the CHROs and the dialogue about what matters about trying to understand engagement, understand attrition, understand retention, and how uh, a CEO is also an HR director. Well, 
every single role has its own job to help facilitate quality data. So the CHRO's principal role is governance. So she or he has a really boring role. It's the worst part of HR analytics, right? But the top executive in HR needs to govern the process, needs to make sure that all of the data is high quality, that you're protecting employee privacy, and that the formulas and the models are actually producing accurate results. The data scientists, they're making sure that you have a single source of truth, and that means that when you're asking what headcount is, what a training course is, um, how much attrition, that if you run the report on a Monday, it should say exactly the same thing as if you run it on a Friday for the same time period, right? So you want to have a single source of truth, that's where the data scientists come in. The HR business partners, and this is, a lot of this is the leadership as well, is they help validate the data, right? So when you get objective data sets and objective criteria, it's the HR business partners that take the subjectivity of what they're looking at and overlay it with an opinion that the CEO can think about. And then the last thing is the H hiring managers actually using the framework, um, the data, and the validated um, objective subjective sets. Now, the one kind of thing I want to highlight, and this is the ethical dilemma that you'll see, is that machines, and you can see it at the bottom, they scale human behavior, right? So a machine is going to scale what's in here, your character. So if you're a high integrity leader, if you're, if you're a leader that has compassion and cares about employees, then when you develop machine learning models, the machines will actually help accelerate the kind of goodness you demonstrate as a leader. But the scary part is if you're not a good person, like if, you, if you're just grumpy all the time, you're about revenue, you're about profit, you don't see the connection between human beings and business success, then machines will actually help accelerate that and will drive um, poor talent outcomes and a, and a poor engagement in your workforce. So the one thing you need to understand is that whatever problems you have in your business, they get worse with machines if you have bad leaders. So the first thing you should do before introducing artificial intelligence is make sure that the character of your CHRO, the character of your C-suite is pointing north, is pointing in the right direction. And if they're compassionate and they care about their employees, then machines can actually help. Okay? Next slide, please. All right, so we're getting to the point where I'm going to talk less. You guys got to talk more. Okay, so ethical dilemmas, and I was smiling during the panel discussion with the CEOs, because they were talking about dilemmas, they were talking about ethics, but it was not really thinking about it in terms of machines or artificial intelligence, right? It was mainly people issues, driving people outcomes, impacting the business. But since the future of work equals people plus machines, you have to consider the ethical issues associated with data. So on the left-hand side, you have regulatory pressures. On the right-hand side, you have social pressures. And remember what I said, machines, what do they do? What do machines do when it comes to human behavior? They scale them, right? They accelerate them. So obviously, diversity and inclusiveness. A machine can help drive more diversity. It can help drive um, non-biased promotion. Same thing when it comes to decision-making. If you use succession planning or nine boxes, you can have a machine do a data-driven nine box, automate your whole process, you know, make your entire team you know, twice as productive as before, but if, again, your character is not where it's supposed to be, you're just going to make quicker decisions that are the wrong decisions, right? So that is really the ethical dilemmas piece. So if we move into the next slide. All right. So the next two slides I'm going to give you is just a, a flavor of how you can get started with this describe, infer, predict mindset. So this is a sample KPI dashboard. 
And you can see that it's been divided into four pillars, right? So each pillar has a title. So in this sample KPI, you see that they're looking at four dimensions. The left-hand side, it says technical development, then it's leadership development, mentoring, and safety and compliance. So this is an example dashboard that a refinery uses. Now, when you think about it, what they're doing is they're actually putting the KPIs within each pillar, and then they're, yes, sir, you had a question? Do we have a... No, they'll bring you the, the microphone. Yes. You always have to talk. Anyways, I, I can speak Great. Uh, since we are talking about the data entry, uh, I just want to ask that, what type of data that uh, we will be entering into this um, uh, AI or machine learning system? Because the data that we get from the market or the data that we have in the industry or the uh, organization that we have, total landscape will be different or the scenario will be different. So how can that uh, data that we get from the market can collaborate with the data that we have in the organizations or that we need in the organizations? How this will collaborate? This is a fantastic question. So now remember, the MC promised I would not make this a technical presentation. So you asked a fabulous technical question, so I'll try to summarize it, is that he's essentially asking, how do you get data into your source system when businesses have different types of contexts, different types of customers, different types of scenarios. So there's three types of data, typically. There's structured, semi-structured, and unstructured data, okay? So structured data is something you would find in a list. It could be an Excel file. So imagine if you said, all right, how many people attended today? And you put the names in a list, that's structured data because it's in a table form and it can be organized and categorized and put into a graph easily, right? Now, unstructured data is on an engagement survey when individuals write comments to a question, right? So they're not answering a question with I, I agree or I disagree. They're, they're actually telling you what they think with written comments. That's an example of unstructured data now, there's a, a way from an engineering standpoint to package that data so you can analyze it. And you can use more statistical techniques to understand what those sentences actually mean when you aggregate them uh, with the rest of the audience. So your, an answer to your question is, if you use sound engineering principles and, and strong governance, then you can take all the data that impacts your business and you can categorize it in a way that's easy to pull and easy to visualize, right? And sometimes if it's a survey, you might need to do a different type of analysis, whereas if it's a KPI dashboard, you're gonna have to create a different data set to present it in this way. But the idea is, is that you just wanna get started. So again, going from zero to one is the hardest thing. You wouldn't believe how long this particular refinery took just to develop this. Right? But once we got from zero to one, we ended up doing the coolest stuff. Um, for example, one of the more advanced use cases we ended up doing is we were taking, now some of you might go, oh, this is a little, little strange case. But when we had COVID, all of the meetings shifted to Zoom, right? And our CEO, and I won't name the company, but our CEO wanted to know how engaged are employees now that they're working primarily from home. So we ended up getting permission from, I think, around 250 employees. So we had a statistical sample. And it was important to get permission once you hear how this case study worked. What we did is we recorded all the meetings that these 250 people went to. And then we built a neural network that took their faces and compared them to a database of facial emotional expressions. So we had a database that had smiles, frowns, confusion, frustration, tired, 
and we would examine these meetings and see, the machine would, how engaged somebody is, right? Now, here's something fascinating, and this is why I want to get you excited, is that when you get into more of the advanced use cases, is that what the machine found is that when an executive was attending the Zoom meeting, what people were saying in the meeting was different than what their face was saying, right? So the executive would talk, and everybody's face would just look terrible. They'd be, mm. But then what they would say is, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. This is, this is a great idea. Mm. You know? And the machine found it, right? And, and so we ended up, and it was an interesting conversation because we're talking to the CEO and we're going, your employees are scared of you, so they're just telling you what you want to hear, but their face says they disagree with everything you're saying. So the only thing that needs to change, because he was expecting that we'd have to launch some big training program about working from home or have to launch some kind of you know, collaboration program, and we said, no, we don't have to launch anything. We just need you to be a better leader. We need you to be nicer to your people. We need you to be compassionate that now they're working from home because of a major pandemic. And it took some coaching for that senior leader. It took that individual to be a little humble. But we got there, and it created a return to work policy that ended up you know, achieving an international award um, for what the company ended up doing. OK? Next slide, please. All right, some more boring stuff. Now, it's funny. You, they chose me as like the last presentation, where it's like, you know, I, I've, I racked my brain and said, like, what kind of picture could I put up here? But this is stuff you need. So when you get this PowerPoint after this conference, you'll go, OK, this is useful, this is good. But literally, I don't have a way to make this more fun. So my, my apologies. But when you look at this, this is a, the type of governance that you need for every single data set. So this is an example of one KPI. And the KPI is looking at professional certification. So the, the, it's simple. The only thing the CEO wants to know is how many employees have a professional certification. Pretty simple, right? But from a data analytics perspective, you have to do governance in such a structured way so that you're always producing quality data. You want to make sure that Whoever says they're certified actually is certified. You want to make sure that the certifications are from reputable vendors, that they're linked to the person's job profile, that they actually drive value, that, that continuing education credits have still been done. All those things have to be thought through. So this is an example of a sheet where you're, you're looking at what's the benchmark, how often do you report it, what are the sources of data, who actually approves the KPI, it's reviewed by this HR Talent Council, if you remember the, the house slide. And then you have the purpose and the KPI formula. So this is just the start of governance. When you get into neural networks and you get into more complicated models, the amount of documentation that the head of analytics needs to do to make sure that the CHRO has high quality data, it's the toughest part of the job. Because professional certification seems simple from a business strategy standpoint, and, and it is simple from a business strategy standpoint. But to generate a report that consistently, accurately stipulates how many certifications are in the organization, you have to use this kind of methodology. Structured, repeatable, scalable, and objective. Right? OK, next slide, please. All right, so now you guys got to talk, OK? We're going to go through a facilitated exercise, and we're going to try to create one KPI together. And you're going to see all the nonsense, all the categories, all the questions that you have to ask just to get this one KPI to a place that the CHRO might approve it. Now, at the end, you're going to go, ugh, maybe we shouldn't have analytics at all. But the point of this is to actually show you that when you're developing analysis, if you want to do it in a professional manner, you, you actually have to put in the work, and you have to ask a lot of questions, and you have to have that governance, and you have to have the CHRO sponsor it. OK, so next slide, please. 
All right, here's the scenario, okay? Your organization is conducting a succession planning process. The CEO has asked for a metric that calculates the strength of your talent pool. You have been requested to create a metric entitled succession planning strength score. So before we even get started with the process, what's your initial thoughts? I'll start calling on you. Any initial thoughts about if the CEO asked you to create a succession planning strength score, what would you look at? How would you respond to that request? What do you think would be involved? Any initial observations? Yes. Is it? Yeah. My initial thought would be, I would look into my existing processes. If I have uh, the existing process that would uh, determine the strength of talent put, so definitely I'm going to look at the existing processes, just to start off with. Okay. And what if the CEO said, I don't like our existing processes? I don't have. <laughs> oh, I, I don't like it. Hmm? Okay. What, what would you do then? So definitely, uh, because if we talk about succession planning, it will definitely have, I'll have to involve the head of departments because uh, they are the one uh, from where we get the feedback about the you know, successor for the rule. So awesome. uh, it won't just be HR, then I'll definitely have to involve all these stakeholders to uh, look into it and definitely the CEO feedback as well. That's great. So. I'm going to compliment her, then you can give her a round of applause because she nailed something. But uh, I got to compliment her first. All right. the, uh, she said, it cannot just be HR. That is the most awesome thing ever. Yes, is that even though you're doing HR analytics, you need the sponsorship of your stakeholders. You need to involve them. So please give her a round of applause. That's awesome. All right. Who else? Yes. Uh, to plan for the succession, first of all, we'll have uh, to. We need uh, data of the resources that we have and the skill set, so that we exactly know who could be a who could be a successor for someone else. So we can plan accordingly. I think data of uh, respective staff, uh, yeah, resources, along with the skill set, is uh, one of the first uh, thing that we need to do for the succession planning. It's also fantastic. Please give her a round of applause. So, oh, come on. Let's give her a real round of applause. There we go. It's like, you know, I'm from the US, I'm from Texas, everything is big there, you know, it's just a big round of applause. So the, the thing that she said, and this, I go back to the initial uh, part of the presentation, the people analytics value chain. So she's, at, she's talking about you need to know the capabilities of your team. You need to know who they are. If we combine it with the prior comment that you have to involve the other departments, it's why you need a structured, sequenced process of how you collect data. Because we've only had two comments, and look how complicated it's getting, right? We, we know that we have to meet with the department heads, so that sounds like, what, four or five meetings at least? We know that we have to analyze capabilities of your staff, so that's more meetings. And you have to now look in systems. Look how complicated it's getting already. And you haven't even scratched the surface of what the formula is going to be, what the benchmark is going to be, and so forth. Any other comments before we get into our first group discussion? You get a round of applause by saying something. Free round of applause. All right, next slide, please. So this is just a hint to help you out. Oh, you had yeah, a comment. I do have one comment. Yes. So, Can you go back to the prior slide? Thank you. So uh, while uh, <coughs> planning for success and planning, there, uh, there will obviously um, for the small scale companies and mid-level companies, there will be limited number of resources, which will obviously have the trouble while making the success and plan, as well as there is a void area where uh, there are head, but uh, the gap is really high. So this succession planning strength score uh, can be really difficult to find out. Yes. Yeah. I, and 
Please give him a round of applause. Yeah. And it also helps us, you know, everyone's participating by doing that, right? So what I love what he said, because we've had three comments now, is now he's talking about the size of the organization. And really, when you're a multinational, you have an embarrassment of riches. You have a strong system. You have a lot of resources. You have a budget. You have executives that are used to the processes. You have benchmarks. It's easier. But when you're a mid-sized organization, or you're an emerging market, or maybe you're a, a bank that's dealing with an economy that's recovering, succession planning is a lot harder. And retaining your talent is a lot harder. And you might only have one successor for five roles, right? So just the point I wanted to make here is just three comments. Only three. One, two, three. And it's already become a super complicated process. And that's why if we go to the next slide, I would encourage you to remember, please go to the next slide. Thank you, sir. Is that the CEO's question, remember what I told you, is about talent management. 99% of the time, the CEO is going to ask you a question about talent management. It's just the way it is, you know? So this case is about succession planning. But all of their comments dealt with steps before talent management. We needed to know about the skills. That's part of strategic workforce planning. The training, the learning and development phase, talent acquisition, culture, culture involving people besides HR. So this is a model that can help you. So whenever you're trying to answer a use case, make sure you start with workforce planning and then progress to the right. OK? Next slide, please. All right, so now let's get into, people can just raise their hand and you can answer one of these questions. So this is kind of the first step, remember, of HR analytics best practices, that CHRO sponsorship is critical. So anyone have any ideas about the behaviors the CHRO should exhibit to sponsor this type of metric? Any ideas? What should the top HR person do to get this project underway. I think uh, HR has a uh, data of all the staff that they have. So he can be one who can say that inst uh, his or her succession can be this person because of so and so reason and because of this performance that he, has, he or she has done so far. So that is the main thing that HR, CHRO can do. It's a good idea. Any other ideas? So think about it. CEO has asked you to create a new metric. It's open-minded. Yes, we yeah. have another one. Yeah, be open-minded. Yes. Say it one more time. Yeah, open-minded. Open-minded. Okay. How would that be uh, mechanized? How would how would that be shown in the business? Yeah, because it's an in initiative, and that would definitely involve other counterparts to also have their comments and remarks that the person has to be open-minded to welcome all the feedbacks. Okay, great. So I'm going to steal a phrase from um, our colleague, Steve McIntosh, who presented earlier today. So it's a manufacturing phrase, but it also applies to this. So repeat after me. First hour. First hour. Full power. First hour, full power. So as a CHRO, your job is to go from zero to one. That means in how you communicate with your staff, how you introduce the project to the business, how you set up meetings. Everyone needs to know, we're doing this. I, I am the top person in HR, and I sponsor this project, and we are doing this. First hour, full power, get on board, show up at the meetings, and bring your ideas. As the leader, you have to sponsor this, or it will not be successful. The process will die, okay? So whatever behaviors you choose, it could be through a communication campaign, it could be attending meetings, it could be simple email. The number one thing is that the CHRO is very explicit that they support 
this particular project, okay? What kind of partnerships are needed to be successful? So we already had one idea involving the other department heads. What other stakeholders should we involve? Yes. Yes. She's coming with the microphone. Both line managers the, will be my stakeholders. Say that one more time, I'm sorry. All the line managers will be my stakeholders. Beautiful. That's wonderful. Let me ask you some questions. Should the CFO be involved? Yes? yes? yes. All right. Should the CIO be involved? Yes. Should the CEO be involved? No. No, 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 no. <laughs> and why do you think the CEO, when it comes to this stage of the process, should not be involved? Any ideas? I think the individuals are responsible for their, for their growth and development, so we need to closely partner with the individual, with the associates, like where they want to grow, where they want to see themselves in the next one year or one to three years or maybe last, um, I mean, next five years. So I think that performance de uh, development conversation needs to happen between the associates and the HR, or maybe the line manager, including all the function heads. And I think that partnership will really take us to that. Um, That's awesome. So the development conversations. I think. Yeah, absolutely. So, and, the, and, and that's a great comment. So just to tie this of why you don't want the CEO involved, is the CEO is, uh, you know, just that power dynamic, you know? And it, 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 this individual, she or he, actually asked for this metric, right? Now, by a show of hands, how many CEOs have you worked for that are opinionated? CEOs opinionated? Yours? That's good. Mine are all <laughs> opinionated, right? And so, what ends up happening is if you allow the top executive to be involved in the development process, more than likely, the KPI is going to be exactly what that person wants. But it may not be what that person needs, right? So since the CEO has sponsored the project, you, you note that, you keep she or he out of the process, and then the CEO can see it at the end and provide comments. That gives an opportunity for the entire organization to weigh in without trying to align their ideas with the top decision maker. All right, how would you manage resistance? I don't know about you, like, so I'm married and I've learned that whenever I go out to eat with my wife, I, it's wherever she wants to go. That's how I manage resistance, right? Is that it, whatever makes her happy, that's what I do. But in terms of the workplace, try to walk me through. Anyone have ideas? If someone said, no, we shouldn't have this metric, or we've already done this metric, or we already have something, what would we do? Oh, can you hand, right. uh, so, both of you so, can comment. Shall I tell it? Yeah. So first, we need to engage the people who, Which are, people? Going to go, who are going to give their input in that initiation and to avoid the resistance we can communicate communicate and communicate for that that's awesome thank you communicate squared that's great um mine yes. is similar so i would i would i was going to say collaboration it should be a collaborative effort of all the stakeholders involved that way um, people feel validated that their responses are being taken into um, you know, uh, taking into consideration, so it's a collaboration. That's a really beautiful comment. Now, think about it as just the, the insights from the entire team so far, is that look at how much work goes into just the initial de design phase of a KPI. When you're hiring an HR technology or an HR analytics person, you want someone that's extremely detail-oriented because that person's gonna have to document all of these meetings, is gonna have to document all of the ideas, and is gonna have to be willing to create the governance that's needed to actually make these ideas come to life, right? 
So in the first step of the process, key takeaways, should the CEO be involved, yes or no? No. And it's good, they already left, so, you know, it's good. Um, should uh, you drive as much collaboration as possible with stakeholders outside of HR? Sorry, it's Texas. Awesome, awesome, all right? And then to manage resistance, you communicate how many times? What was it? Communicate, communicate, communicate. Yes, as many times as possible, right? So over-communicate, make sure the CEO stays out of the way, at least during the design process, and then bring as many people into the discussion as possible. Cool, so step one, aren't you tired already? Like, oh my gosh, this is only one KPI, right? And what you'll find is the CEO might give you a week to do all of this, and we'll ask for five or six. So that's a different challenge, but we're just going through one. So we went through the first step. All right, can we move forward, please? All right, building governance. So how, what kind of process should we follow to design the KPI and get the approval. Any ideas? You can cheat off of what I said, or you can come up with uh, what you do at your organization, but any new comments? How would you actually design the KPI and create a process for approving it? What would you do? So earlier I said something wasn't a union. What was that? Talent council, right? So do you think that'd be a good idea? Create maybe a talent council to collect all the ideas, to review it, and then have the CHRO do the final approval of the metric? Yes or no, you think that'd be good? It was yes or no, not, not blank. So, yeah, do you think a talent council would be useful? Yes or no? Yes, all right. How would you handle change? All right, so let's say you're making progress on the KPI design, and then there's a lot of different changes being requested, and they're by senior people. So let's say the CFO wants one thing, the CIO wants something else, and they're both senior executives, how would you handle that as the HR director? Any ideas? Interaction? Yeah, absolutely. So you really have to be a collaborator and you have to seek a win-win solution. So diplomacy, discussions, solutioning, and taking different stakeholder views and merging them into a solution is what's required. Very difficult when you're dealing with senior executives. All right? And just um, give me one example of what you would need to involve the chief information officer in. Why would that person need to be involved in this metric? He's the source of data, he or she, right? That's awesome. Yeah, so you need that person to make sure that you're driving processes that have quality data, because remember, CHRO governs the quality, so obviously you need to have the CIO. Okay, so building governance, I can tell by the interaction of the crowd, it's no fun, right? And what I'll say is that there's not a company that I've worked with that enjoys this step. It's boring. Um, it's, it's monotonous, it requires a lot of attention to detail, but I have to tell you, if you don't do this, if you don't build governance, you won't have high quality data, and then whatever output you produce uh, will not be uh, something that can actually drive quality decision making. Quality data equals quality decisions. All right, next slide, please. Okay, the technology roadmap. So now we have to figure out what tech, what sources of data would you look at if you're trying to create a succession planning metric? So where would you go for the data? 
Any ideas? We could start with something simple like the HRIS system, the core HR system, right? You'd go to their employee records, that may, might be one. What else, what other data would you look at? Say that again? Yeah, HR database, right? And we keep. Yes, please say it again. It's awesome. Please, please keep going. Yep. Go ahead. Generally, we keep we maintain the data. It's a database where uh, everything uh, we put in a single Excel format. We can maintain the Excel sheet also, where there is a uh, personal information as well as uh, academic background as well as their family information as well as their work experience related to and uh, what are the that KPIs and KRA sets that also we can uh, track in that then we can that for in that format we can maintain the database is a database there okay yeah thank you for the the comments it's great now you're gonna find that your idea has some challenges when you want to answer numbers two and three. So let's say you pulling data from your learning management system, your HR database. You don't want it to be manual, right? You don't want to pull the data every single day in a manual fashion. You want to automate it. Any ideas on how to automate the process? Now, this isn't an engineering presentation. I'm not going to go into technical aspects of how you can create an automated workflow that you know, doesn't have human interface, human touch points. But the point that I'm making is that any KPI you create should be fully automated. It should be able to produce data without a single human being touching it. All right? That's the only way it's sustainable. Because the minute a human being touches it, it becomes too much work, it becomes subjective, and it's easy to manipulate, and then the accuracy goes down. So the best way to automate a KPI is you have to pull the data directly from the system. So this, this gentleman's idea about an Excel file, it's great. Everything he said was great. The only thing I would caution is that when you put data into an Excel file, now it becomes manual, right? It now becomes something that can be manipulated, and it now becomes a lot of work. So you want to do exactly what he said, but you want to figure out a way to keep it in the source system and then have processes that pull it into reports for your executives. And then how would you protect employee privacy? Any ideas? Because succession planning, I see a hand raised over there. So, uh, protecting employee privacy would be uh, by giving access to only authorized employee and uh, reviewing, it, reviewing the access frequently, you know, on a regular basis. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, which body or which governance function should decide who has access to data? You can just shout it out. It's not a union. The talent council, right? So now do you see how the talent council can be used? You can use the talent council to determine what's the automation process, to determine who has access to the data. And because it's a council and it has minutes and it's approved by the CHRO, it has authority. It has governance. And that means that your data will stay high quality. So you can already see that in these initial steps, there's so many activities that council will be responsible for ensuring that you have quality data, okay? Next step. Okay, now we're gonna have some fun and I want to hear your opinion because I already know the answers, right? I already have the answers to this test. So I, I wanna hear your opinions. So what are the key components of this KPI? 
So if you're designing a, a metric that says succession planning strength, what would the formula look like? You can come up with just any part of it, any data element, anything. We'll build it together. You could think about things Steve said in his presentation earlier, some of the things the CEO said. What would you look at in building this formula? Any ideas? The data that we keep uh, should be uh, quantifiable. That is the major component. Or that can be major, measured. Oh, there you are. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. Say it one more time. Measurable and quantifiable uh, is the major component. Fantastic. Okay. Measurable, verifiable. <laughs> what? Yeah, give him a hand of applause. There you go. All right. So help me out here. We need to be specific, right? Who is the target population? Who are we looking at when we're looking at succession planning strength? What kind of employees? Subordinates. Who is directly working under that particular person? Key yeah. positions. Key persons. High potentials? Yeah, key position. Someone that could potentially become a CFO? Become a CIO? What do you think? Yes? All right. So when you, before, and this is the point I want to make with this, before you decide the target population, shouldn't you understand the target roles that you're looking at? Because if you're looking at succession planning strength, that's tied to positions, right? So wouldn't it make sense to start with what are your top 50 positions in the company and create a list of that? What do you think? Yes or no? I think yes, right? So the, the idea with this is that the target population is you're looking at the top 50 roles in the organization, and then also you want to know what employees could potentially become the incumbents of that role. Who are the future CFOs? Who are the future CIOs? Who is the future head of sales? And so forth, right? Any ideas on the formula? Oh, uh, speak up, please. Actual by, actual by target. Actual by target. Into 100. Yeah, so you're, you're looking at how many successors you have versus a target. So a coverage ratio. Awesome. That's awesome. That's very good. Any other ideas before we move forward? Uh, I just wanted to add one thing uh, regarding the key components of KPI. It's there said, it is. It Sorry. said it's yes. measurable, but what about the uh, time period? I think it's one of the key components. Like previous um, speakers said that uh, you have uh, different, uh, uh, they have different years of period that they have inserted in the plans and career development. So shouldn't that be considered uh, among that KPI? Absolutely. That's a fantastic. Yes. Yeah, so are they ready? What's the readiness? All right. So repeat after me. So there's three components and, and it was mentioned earlier today. So potential, potential, performance, readiness. That's the components for succession planning strength. Potential, potential, Performance, performance, readiness. So if you understand what's the potential of your employees, how are they performing in their roles, and what's their readiness for the next role, you can calculate succession planning strength. Right? Okay. Next slide, please. What's that? Oh, well, we'll get there. Yeah, we'll get there. Yeah, so now the last one, all right? Now I said, I tried, I mean, I, I thought of like what pictures I could show, but this is the kind of stuff with HR analytics. It's, it's very much governance-based, detail-based, question-based in order to produce quality data. 
But once you actually have the formula in place, how would you test it? Any ideas? Oh, could you uh, get the microphone, sir? A separate environment needs to be created um, yep. for parallel running and testing so, so that there's no operational disruptions. So someone is uh, very skilled in IT, understands about that. That's fantastic. Yes, yeah, so you want to create a, um, per, instead of putting data what's called into production, you're putting it into a testing phase. And during the testing phase, you're running the KPI to make sure it's repeatable and it produces the same results, right? So once you get the formula, before you go to the CHRO to approve it and before you launch it into the business, you want to do a lot of test runs to make sure that you can get the same result over and over and over, okay? Now, the last question is how should the results be used for decision making? So let's say you have a succession planning strength score and it says it's from zero to 100%. How would you use that data to help the CEO make decisions? Any ideas? It's tough, right? But this is, this is what is so beautiful about analytics is look, at, and look how hard this exercise is. Is you not only have to figure out how to design the KPI, you have to figure out who to involve in the process. You have to understand how you're going to automate it. What technologies are you going to use? How are you going to protect employee privacy? And you have to know, how are you going to test it? Then, how are you going to communicate the metric to leadership? And once you've done that, you have to figure out, how is it actually going to be used? And that's one KPI. But the idea is, is that if you're able to develop this muscle, if you're able to develop this governance process, and you're able to build a KPI dashboard that has these metrics that are repeatable, that can be used for decision making, then you can move along that phase schedule of describe, infer, predict, where you're going from kind of a basic reporting function into an advanced machine learning function. So next slide, we'll show you how an example output of this. Perfect. All right. So this is an example of how this formula was created at another organization. They go through the same process you just went through. So the audience, they decided, was any individual listed on a leadership succession plan? So that's who they were going to examine. The elements were the three I mentioned, potential, performance, and readiness. And you have to measure those three dimensions with data. Some of the sources of data are talent assessments, performance ratings, promotion velocity, how often somebody is promoted their critical skills, the type of training they've had, the coaching and development discussions that were mentioned, right? Job rotations, nine box, and so forth. So there's all these sources of data, right? And then the systems are the HRIS system and the learning management system. So this is the, the core systems that will be used to generate the data sets uh, and make sure that it's automated. So the formula that they used is simple, potential, times performance, times readiness, gave you an individual strength score for anybody that was listed on a succession plan. And then you take individual strength and you add it to the percent of critical roles with unique successors. So that sounds like word salad, right? A lot of numbers and da da da, da. But essentially, what that ends up doing is giving you a score from zero to 100%, and the higher the number, the stronger your succession planning strength, right? So the reason for this example is in order to get to something like this, you have to go through all those steps we just went through and you have to meet with everybody and you have to create the governance to incorporate the ideas so that you can actually have all the executives sign off on this approach, okay? Next slide, please. All right, so this, we can get into some questions, but when we distribute out the PowerPoint, I, to help you out, if you can go to the next slide, please. 
In this uh, PowerPoint, I just gave some example of KPIs that you can look at that are connected to each of these uh, value chain elements. So you'll see that for strategic workforce planning, these are some KPIs that you can look at, your sourcing strategy, your leadership spans and layers, and your, your compensation metrics. And if you just kind of scroll through the next couple slides, you'll see that I've, I've given you different uh, KPIs. They're simple, they're basic, but if you're looking to start a KPI dashboard and link it to the, the value chain and, and kind of start with something instead of starting from scratch, these are some metrics that you can consider. So with that, you know, I, I'm sorry that we had to do it at the end of the day. It's a really heavy subject, um, but it's something I'm very passionate about. So before we get to questions, I just want to emphasize a couple things. The future of work equals people plus machines. That's awesome. Should the CEO be involved? No. no. Well, you said everybody's learning, man. This is awesome. I think I feel great. It's like you learned. This is awesome. All right. Should everybody be involved in the process, not just HR? Yes. yes. So there you go. You, you got, this is simple. All right. So I'm going to stop with those questions because I'm doing good. The audience knows all that stuff. Um, but with that, I'll kind of close. Is there any questions or any comments or anything I can cover? Because it's been really a blessing to, to see your beautiful country and, and also to talk with you today. So any questions? And if you want, you can always connect with me on LinkedIn. So in addition to um, some of the consulting projects I do, I'm also a professor at University of North Texas. Um, love learning, love collaborating. So go ahead and connect with me on LinkedIn. And if you have questions, just message me and I'm happy to, to talk with you about it. All right. Thank you. If they have questions, yeah. Do you have any questions, the audience? I think they're super tired. Yeah, I don't think <laughs> we have questions, but thank you so much, David, especially for being here for this particular session, you know, sharing all your insights and your experiences with us. We really appreciate your presence here today. Thank you. Uh, let me invite Mr. Ojha sir, to please be on stage to give away the token of appreciation to Mr. David. One more time, a big round of applause to Dr. David for his insightful presentation for all of us. Thank you so much, I request.